someone asked me how do i find youtubers for my videos yeah just courage <laughs> there's a switch that can open <laughs> thank you apple <laughs> so i think you're definitely on a good like great path like super super great path so hello everyone i'm incredibly excited to welcome our special guest today andre the brilliant mind behind mix and jam you have taken the game development community by storm with your engaging and insightful content where you skillfully recreate and explore game mechanics from some of our favorite titles your passion for both gaming and development shines through in every video inspiring countless aspiring creators along the way and I can't wait to dive into our conversation today and learn more about your journey, insight, and the creative process behind Mix and Jam. So welcome here. Thank you. That's very sweet. That's very sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. And yeah, thanks for the introduction. That's really sweet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm also excited. Thank you very much for accepting it. So I saw that in a mini interview for Domestica, you said that you don't have a background in programming, which makes me curious to know what you studied before this field and how you ended up working in game development or has it always been like a dream yeah i think once i realized that creatively i, I started developing skills that were very interesting in the field of games i realized that i wanted to work with games anyways but my or original education was on design and back in my university so i'm originally from brazil and so in my university uh, I would, I started doing the design course, which is like a general design course. You learn all the design fundamentals, but you choose whether you want to go graphic, whether you want to go uh, web design and all these things. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do something on games, but on theory, that was really hard because I didn't know if I was going to go into the actual programming of it uh, or just the theoretical part of doing the project balancing and level design and so on. So that was the initial thought that I was going to participate in a more project oriented way. Um, but I also wasn't very hopeful just because I was in Brazil and I didn't know exactly how the industry was doing back then for that specific scenario in Brazil. Um, but then I had the opportunity to study abroad and that opportunity is where I learned essentially to program and to sort of use unity in general. And that's where I, I, I really got started. And the most important part about that, was the way that everything was taught to me like i think that the teachers that i had and the people that were around me were fundamental because like i was never good at math and i was never like a very technical person but i think that when people educate you properly and they showcase that you know programming is not is not a beast or anything um that's when you really shine through and you start getting into the concepts of how powerful programming can be. And I think that's what happened to me where I just felt that um, someone was giving me attention and giving me the right resources so I could learn. And so, as you can see, it was very powerful because I started to do my own stuff. And yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not anything uh, special. It's just that I had a great opportunity with great people to learn. And then I just decided to continue on that uh, empowering feeling, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I really empathize with what you're saying because I also don't have a background in anything related to math, like programming and stuff like that. I'm also currently studying multimedia and creative technologies. I'm passionate about design in general. It doesn't really matter web design, UX design. But uh, yeah, I also got interested in this field thanks to the teachers and the university itself. So that's why I'm here today. <laughs> there you go. So very similar. Yeah. But yeah, like... Edu education is crucial, uh, especially mm -hmm. with games, because when you play certain types of games or AAA games for that matter, uh, it's always going to feel like an impossible task where you're going to look at it and you're never going to know exactly how you're going to get there. Um, and with games, it's very important to have someone that can... Like, games are not easy, right? Mm -hmm. But the barrier of learning them should be, like, easier. And when people make that easier easier for you, I think that's when it really works. And when you really get started with the sort of flow, you know? Yeah, you're right. And now probably just like everyone else, I am very curious about what it's like to work at Unity and how hard is it actually to get a job there? If of course it's okay for you to share this. If not, <laughs> skip it. 
<laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. How it feels to work? It's been it's been a while now, so it's in, it's a question that I haven't been asked recently. I think, mm -hmm. but I think it's really cool. So Unity has because of the amount of departments it has, right? Uh, whether it's things on the actual engine, whether that's things outside of the engine, there's such a variety of people working at Unity that I think that as a professional, as a creative, as a human being, just being in that place and sharing the same space with all these creative people, it's amazing. And I think that also there's like some, there's a lot of Unity legends that uh, remain at Unity. And when you get to interact with these people or like, uh, create projects or work with them is that you really feel you, you just feel something special like there's they're, they're legends for a reason so it's awesome to be around there and learn I think uh, the nice thing about being at Unity is that I learn a lot um, and you know like of course it's like a technology like we're working on the technology of the engine and whatever but um, I, I still think that there's a lot of creative minds there and it's very nice and then to answer your question about how hard is it to get a job, I, I actually don't know the answer to that because I think the the difficulty of finding a job lies upon many variables, right? I don't think it's just like easier or hard to get in. I will say that there are many positions at Unity, um, but that's what I'm like, similar to what I was saying previously, um, there's a huge variety of roles. So, so whether you're working on a specific product and whether you're like a as an example, web developer on that very specific product, right? Or if you actually want to work on the engine, then these are two completely separate things. But um, I think there's no harm in trying. As far as I know, Unity has a careers page that you can just hop in and uh, and check out what's available, what's nearby, and uh, always try. Like, I don't know, like, I don't know how hard it is. I just think that if anyone has an interest on trying, I think people should just try, right? Like there's no harm in trying and 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 learning, but I'm not gonna say, I, I think it's just as hard or easy as getting any other job, to be honest. That's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just go for it. Courage, I think that's all it takes, honestly. And <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Of course, yeah. I build a nice portfolio, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any tips or tricks about that? <laughs> I think, right, if we're talking specifically about if you're applying to a role for something specifically on graphics or VFX, right, for that matter, um, I often say this to people, like, you just need to, your portfolio to have quantity sometimes because a lot of people think about quality mm -hmm. and I think it's fair. It's fair to think about quality, but quantity... Um, from the employer perspective, I think it reassures people that you're like, you've been to multiple scenarios, you're doing this, that you're, you react well under pressure, you can do a lot of stuff, you can do a lot of different stuff. Um, so that's why, like, specifically, when we talk about creating games, I think that um, the more little project that you can do, and accepting the fact that some projects will actually be pretty bad, but that some will be good, and just put that into your experience i think it shows to the employer and this is all assumption right but for me i think it shows that you know how to work with different scenarios right and i think the coolest thing about learning uh specifically with mix and jam for example is that because there's a variety of projects i feel myself a little bit more knowledgeable not on the technical side like it's not that i know more coding or less coding but I've definitely tried different things, right? Different genres. And I think that if I was, for example, the hiring manager, I think I would really value someone who's worked in different things mm -hmm. and they're, they can adapt to any scenario because that's just the reality of work. At some point you'll, you'll need to adapt. So variety is a good word. Quality, you can keep it, but variety is very interesting. So just, yeah, just try to find projects that, you know, personal projects, projects that you gather with a friend, uh, or that you actually done for freelance work uh, that you can just gather and mm -hmm. mass populate that portfolio yeah also blaster said having a problem solving skill yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i guess you know in the other hand is uh, when you show up to these interviews uh to try to be the nicest human possible mm -hmm. it's very important for us to just be nice humans i think that mm -hmm. in any working environment people appreciate like uh, gentle people so 
that's another <laughs> that's another tip okay i'll keep those in mind now back <laughs> to your i don't know if childhood or you know teenage years are there any particular games or developers that have significantly influenced your work yeah 100 percent. like I, I think at this point i've said this so many times but it's still true like of course nintendo is the biggest one which one you know i think which nintendo oh, the or mm -hmm. uh i mean everything uh but <laughs> i will say like the n64 and gamecube are like the biggest things that are in in my memory and even games that i i use as a reference myself but um I think, yeah, like it started as a genuine like, oh, yeah, I'm just enjoying games from this specific company because they're like maybe targeted a little bit more towards kids. Uh, but then as I grow as a professional, I realized that I think that the other reason why I love Nintendo is the approach that they take for game design, which is often mm -hmm. like they'll find the mechanic first. So they'll like polish the game mechanic and try to make it, uh, you know, as interesting and special as it is and then build a world around it. So examples like Splatoon or like a link between worlds, like there's very specific mechanics. They're thinking about the play, right? And I think that as a game designer slash game developer, like play means everything. And I think that Nintendo specifically uh, puts a huge focus on, on play. But uh, one of my favorite games is Mario Galaxy. And I think that there's many reasons. I think that Mario Galaxy has all of these things that I just mentioned sort of like together. Like it has the nice mechanic sweetness and the, you know, sort of like the gameplay of the game revolving around everything Galaxy. Uh, but it's also so like, I don't know if it's just my nostalgia speaking up, but like it has like this emotional uh, spirit to it. Like the soundtrack and the graphics and everything is so special. So I, I have no idea if I'm just biased or if it's like one of the best games in the world, you know, like I, I just don't know, but it's definitely inspirational. Interesting story. Now, um, what inspired you to start Mix and Gem and how did you develop the concept over time? Talking about mechanics and design and, you know. It's funny because Mix and Jam was actually initially just a game jam that I was organizing um, back in Brazil which the idea was to like put two different genres together, mix them up and then make it for the jam. That's why the name is Mix and Jam. Um, so I had that logo. It's, it's interesting. Like the first thing I had was like a logo, but that's a side. That, that was one thing, like one idea that I had. And then uh, on my beginning years of learning Unity and getting good at it and start, start learning, um, I think as everyone realizes that if you just decide to enter into a production uh, mindset of like a specific indie game, you, you know that's just gonna take you a long time. And depending on your like will or your resources, that can be frustrating. So I think I've tried a couple of times of like working on a bigger scale game, doing something that would actually go into consumers' hands. And then at some point I just realized like, if my goal is to learn as fast as I can and then get better at game dev, I think it was very frustrating at me in the start to just uh, maintain one specific project. So then I start looking for reasons or things that I could do to keep practicing in like shorter bursts. My first thing that I ever did was I just want to I just want to dissect Star Fox. How does that work? How does that on rail camera work? And how does the movement work on that confined space? Um, so I did that and I actually showed that to one of my teachers back in the day uh, and I was showing him and explaining him why I did that. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just recreating this mechanic because uh, I feel like t isolating this very specific piece uh, helped me learn a lot and I can make like a an open GitHub of it and then people can learn. Um, and while I was telling uh, this to my teacher, he said like, what you just did, the process of you telling me why you recreated and for yourself as a game dev, like why um, why you want to do this and the way you want to share about the story. I think it's a nice, uh, it's definitely a nice sentiment. It's something that I would like to watch, like see you do more. And ever since I got back from that conversation, and this is after I graduated, but I then came back from this conversation. I was like, that's, I mean, that is genuinely interesting. Like the fact that you, I mean, personally, I was taking something almost like a tool, like a tip 
a way to learn, a way to sort of like practice, a way that would allow me to practice and not frustrate me. Um, so if you take that sentiment and sort of like combine it with the fact that I was graduated as a designer and I had all these like different skills for graphic design, for video, for motion on all these things, uh, for audio, whatever. It felt almost natural that a YouTube channel uh, could come in place out of that, right? There was the sentiment of what I want to do and was there was some very basic knowledge of how to put videos together um, and like some branding, which is something I, I always think about just because of my background. So all these things came together and I was like, I'm just going to try. Um, so in the very start, I was like very imposter syndrome. I thought that the channel was going to be only UI stuff. Like I'm just going to do, cause like, if you look at my two first two videos, it's all UI. I was like, yeah, you know, I feel like that's more realistic and these are things that I can achieve, but yeah, like that's how it started. But after I, I was posting my initial two to three videos, I was just like, you know what? I'm here anyways. So I might as well just like dip my toes into to 3d or real time and VFX and all this stuff. And turns out like I was feeling comfortable, right? Whether the result is good or not, I don't think that matters so much. I think I was, I was feeling comfortable and the videos were, and video slash projects were improving progressively just because of the fact that I was putting it out there, right? Because, you know, I didn't take too long to post it because I just said like, whatever, I'll consider it an experiment. And then the experiment turned out to what it did. Um, so I'm really happy, really happy. And I guess I'm always going to shout out uh, my teachers and the people involved in the, in the process because even on that side, even on the sort of sentiment of uh, giving me the idea to share this as a resource, uh, it all came from them as well. So Yeah, it's very sweet that you had that teacher and inspired you to actually allow your creativity flow and you know but talking about UI, you're many curious about your first two videos were they about like ui in general or about games like ui in games so the first two videos i remember they were on smash brothers and on mm -hmm. mario odyssey right so the first 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 video was mario odyssey because it was like on mario odyssey there's like a, a world level selector where the globe of the mario odyssey world like spins on the level that you want to select um and that on itself i thought thought looked nice and was something that i could achieve with rotations and some ui overlaying um and then the second one is the classic when you're selecting fighters on smash brothers i think it's something that it's very interesting it's a very niche thing but i i remember when i was young and playing smash brothers like ah, how do they do that? You know, how do they load all the characters available? And then you have this little hand where you place a token. It's a very unique way of selecting characters that I think we take for granted. Like uh, some other fighter games will just have you up down, like just navigate through the UI and select. As with Ma Smash Brothers, you have these tokens. So the two first videos, what I mean by UI is that they don't go so much about like the real time uh, movement of a character interacting with multiple things. It was a much confined, much more confined uh, scope on, in that case. I also have a curiosity. So I started a kind of a series on my channel. I just did one episode, but I promise more is going to come. Trying to recreate famous games interfaces. Is that a good way to start learning UI? Absolutely, right? Because in that game that was released, there's going to be, you know, a lot of fundamentals that were successful in that game, right? You're playing that game anyways, that game has sold and the game is successful. So there's a lot of things that will be applied like contrast, uh, visibility, positioning, anchoring, all these sort of things are very interesting. So it's 100% a, a nice way to, to learn. And I have friends that are diving into the area of game UI, UX, and I also recommend the same approach, right? is to do a little bit of that, but also mix it with your own small projects. Hence why I always recommend as well game jams and so on. Like, I think these are recreations and game jams are like two really good approaches to use to sort of learn. We also got a few questions from Lit Wave Studio Fast. Uh, if you are Brazilian, you said it already. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've never been there though, but 
the festival and what I see from Rio, it's amazing every year. Nothing but greatness. I love, I love Brazil. <laughs> if anyone from Brazil is watching. <laughs> from uh, McDonald's uh, Trump, he asks, I think, what does he think of Unity 6? I think it's, um, for from what I've, I've been personally trying, I think it's a pretty solid release. I think that it comes in a really good time also like the sort of like stability and the new features added after the whole fiasco of like runtime fee so i think like i've, I've been using it myself and there's there's a, a few things that i want to highlight that i think are good i know that the ui has like a little bit of a refresh so that's nice um but also you know when you're creating assets on the project window uh the, it, it used to have this huge list of items when you like go ahead and create a new asset now everything is organized into sort of like smaller categories then when you when you create a material, for example, you go create rendering and then you go material, which just means that the menu is a lot less vertical. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, but that on itself sometimes makes me just want to create a new project in Unity 6 as opposed to anything else. Um, and then I know I know there's a lot of uh, a new like graphics API things that are super nice. So there's this, for example, this um, asset store tool for creating outlines that really is made possible because of the this random technology in Unity 6. It's called Lineworks. Unity 6 is like enabling this kind of stuff. And I love outlines and sort of like using outlines for information, for polish, for navigation. So yeah, bunch of cool stuff. And I'm sure that people are already used to like listening to all the other good features. Uh, like, I don't know, all the graphics improvements and stuff, but uh, I think it's just stable. I think that's very nice, right? Uh, it being stable. Jackim also asks, um, what motivates you and what pushes you to go on with game development? I don't know. Like, I'm just, I'm, I, I like to believe I'm really creative. And I think games are such an incredible avenue of expressing creativity. Like, there's no other way to put it. Like, games are a conjunction of, you know, storytelling, uh, interaction, visuals, plus you know, plus logic, plus play, plus the fact that someone can like press a button and make something happen in your game. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what motivates me to continue is just that I'm, I, I, I like, there's no rest for me. I'm just, I just like being creative. And the, the best way I've found to express my creativity is throughout, through games. So, that's what I would like to continue doing. Just always um, making a small game here, a small prototype, you know, release something or maybe not release it. Um, it's a very interesting sort of like dilemma to be in because a lot of the things that you work on, not necessarily gonna see the day of light, but I don't think it's time wasted because I think at the end of the day, you were creative and you expressed that creativity somehow. Um, but of course, it's always nice to publish your stuff. So mm -hmm. wrap it up you know, and uh, and put it out there. Interesting. Also, Lead Waves, I think, said hi in your language. Yeah. <laughs> I won't read it. <laughs> so it says, essentially, like, hey, what's up, bro? Okay. <laughs> Blaster also asked uh, if you like Mega Man. I do I like Mega Man, but when I was younger, I think I liked more the Network series. I don't even know if it's an age thing, but back in that specific period, I, th I was enjoying a lot of like uh, more edgy stuff, to be honest, like Sonic Adventure and like that approach. And I think mm -hmm. that the network series for Battleman, they're like trying to be a little bit more on that. But also because the gameplay mechanic of Battle Network games are super nice. So I have like a, a very special memory towards that. But I, I never played the classic Mega Man too much like the 2D stuff. Now back to my questions. What do you think are the key elements that make a game mechanic fun and engaging? A game mechanic that really works is something that somehow allows you to express your inputs in an interesting output, right? So with the press mm -hmm. of one button, you can do this. I think that to simplify the answer, that's it. How much stuff can happen when I just press a single button? So you're like maximizing the input from the user. So they're just doing like this one thing and on the screen, a lot of things happening. Like there's visuals that are happening. There are movement options that are being open, but that's on isolation. And I think that 
The other thing that makes mechanics good to use is in context. For example, if you take the mechanic from A Link Between Worlds and that sort of like cool mechanic of being able to like merge with the wall, at the end of the day, that's just a movement option, right? It's like, I'm going to walk on walls. In any other context, you don't even need to merge with the wall. You could just potentially change the gravity and be walking on the walls. Um, but that's the thing. The, the reason why it's good is because one, yes, it feels super nice to be able to like cling into the wall and sort of like walk on it. But of course, the level design allows you to express that, right? So if you think about it, the perfect game mechanic is something that not only gives you maximum output, but also allows you to express more and more things. So if the mechanic is a triple jump, you need a whole world where that triple jump makes sense. And these are some concepts that are descripted on the Game Feel book by Steve Swink. There's like this really nice book called a guide or something like that, like a game view, a guide to virtual sensation. And it's talking about like, yes, this concept of maximum output, but also contextualizing. So every game mechanic needs to have some context to work. So on the mixing jam videos, I always try, for example, to put at least one interactable in the scene so that you can use that game mechanic in like a, a small loop but at least that it has some context. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's interesting way of seeing things. Uh, Lit Waves also asks, do you have any tips on how to stay motivated to finish a project? So I think that's the number one thing to think about. Like you're not alone. I think that helps a little bit. But I think number two is that you have to put a producer role. And I will say this because that's an, a lesson I have to learn every day, every project I start. There's a point where you have to use a producer role uh, hat and just be like if i had to finish this game with only the systems i have now right like you literally create these constraints i think that's a good way to sort of like finish the project to stay motivated though it's not something i can tell you it's easy like oh just just stay motivated now i think going through the process of finishing a project is crucial for you to understand that you're not always going to be motivated, if that makes sense. So if, for example, you know, you're unmotivated, maybe it's because it, it hasn't reached where you want to go or where you want to be. But that's the problem, right? Like, I think that you have to be able to look at the things that you have. I'll just give you a concrete example. Let's say in this, in, in this game, you made your character can jump. There's a switch that can open <laughs> Thank you, Apple. <laughs> there's a switch that can open. There's a switch that can open doors and close doors. And there's, uh, I don't know, like this magnet platform that pulls you to the other side. If those are the only things that you have, think of a MVP of your game that uses only that. Maybe it's not the point where you want to go, right? The vision. But that's the thing. You have to understand that if you're working on a game solo or with a small team, you have to think that everything is resources. Thinking about new features is a resource. It's time. It's like, it's your it's your emotional stability is your like psychological as well, right? Everything is not just code, code, code. Sometimes it's also just like thinking about it. And from a design perspective, sometimes it's really nice to, to you know, sort of like scope your game with only the things you have. So if a programmer has made for you three mechanics, try to make an entire game out of those three mechanics. And then hopefully that can help you build a smaller scope of a game. And then by seeing the finish line, maybe that helps you be more, more motivated. Very useful advice. I will try to apply everything that you mentioned here. Remember, I also have to apply that to myself because a lot of the times I'm not like that, but uh, I'm projecting, you know? What was the most surprising thing you learned while creating content for Mix and Jam? I think the most surprising thing is how nice the community was. I just did this in an experimental mindset, but the way people embraced it always makes me think about how nice people were and also just how great YouTube and every other outlet is great for niches because at the end of the day, it is a niche game development, uh, I don't know, game development, YouTube videos or game development in general. It's a very niche topic, but there's so much people out there, right? So no niche is small. And I think that that's the thing that surprised me the most. And then the additional thing was considering that this was a, a, a good niche. I was also surprised by the fact of how many people I got to collaborate with. 
like people that I was a fan of their work, people that were doing amazing stuff. And I was like, I wonder if I can just message them. And I did. And the surprising part is that a lot of people reply and a lot of people are willing to do collaborate and try things together, you know? Uh, so that's definitely the second surprise thing. McDonald Trump asks, how often should I use ChatGPT for Unity? I think that's just personal. Like, if you feel like that's gonna help you, you can use it. I think my only advice for that is that there is definitely some like communication issues because these two things are in like silos, right? Like you're you're developing here and using so, so ChatGPT might never like not might not always know exactly what's going on with your project. So it does not matter if you use it much or if you use it less. The important thing is for you to be the connection and to understand what's going on. Because if you rely exclusively on any like chat AI kind of thing, you're never going to learn, right? You're never going to learn why this thing that was generated is helping you with the said game mechanic that you're developing. So it's important for you to understand what's going on so that you have control. Um, and I don't say this in a control freak way. I just mean that as a creative, as someone who's making a game, you want to understand what's going on because you want to eventually add new features. You want to eventually change things on your liking or polish certain code. So definitely good to understand your code, but by all means, use whatever you feel like to help get your coding on, right? Speci like, especially if it's something that for you is boring. For me personally, like everything is still so exciting that I'm fine with just uh, with just programming by myself, but you know, whatever. It's like sometimes people copy entire things from Stack Overflow. Mm. Like I, I don't think it matters, right? At the end of the day, it's like, you do you do what you do to get your your products and your games done so it is what it is i don't know sometimes i just feel a bit uh guilty because i use chatgpt and the assets from the unity asset story not actually making my own stuff but hopefully one day it's gonna happen have you used other game engines before i've been i've been trying godot recently together with a friend um so we've been doing some stuff there I don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, to like actually get into it, uh, but it's very promising. I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, I've tried Unreal like very quickly. I've tried Construct in another company that I was working on. Uh, there was some stuff that was being made with Construct. Um, but, but yeah, I think Unity is the, is the number one, mostly because that's the one I've learned. And uh, to sort of like go off your next uh, comment there, mm -hmm. like you were thinking about leaving. Um, that's the thing that, for example, for me, it's one thing that you have to also use the producer hat, right? You you should use any engine to do to deliver what you want to deliver. But the thing is, you have to use the producer hat to be like, my time, right? How much time do I have to learn this new engine? I think that people can switch when they're still learning their way around multiple things, or they want to achieve a specific thing that can only be achieved as a certain engine. If you feel comfortable with an engine, my honest opinion is just like, just stay on it. Yeah, because uh, you're taking away overhead from the work that you do by being frustrated and not understanding what's going on with the engine. Uh, when you're just using what you're used to, by all means, use that. You know, the same could be said about any graphics software. Like some people be like, oh yeah, but should I stop using Photoshop? It's like, I mean, <laughs> sure. Like, but if you feel comfortable, like if you can do the stuff that you always did in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you just want to test an idea, uh, it feels like the tools are just tools to get you there. I'm curious, are there any trends in gaming development that you are most excited about right now? I think I've, I've been... You know, I think with the big demand on sort of like multiplayer experiences, I can see that there has been a, a huge demand on on making multiplayer more easy and accessible. And I know, for example, like tools that are making that e easier. I have a colleague that is working on this very powerful extension. It's called Coherence. And this extension that makes it super easy for you to create your own multiplayer, maintain clients and stuff. Um, and that's the thing, right? Like. Any game developer, if you tell them, like, let's make a multiplayer game, everyone will run away, which makes sense. Uh, I think it's just multiplayer games are super hard. But if you were to think, like, what if 
making multiplayer games was super easy, right? So I do hope that all engines on this space uh, make significant efforts to sort of like make that easier because I'm 100% sure if making multiplayer games was just easy, just like, oh yeah, easy. I don't know, a button that says make multiplayer. Uh, but if it was like that, I can guarantee you that a lot of people would be making multiplayer games because sometimes that's the experience you want to develop. Um, so that's a trend, I guess, that I would love to see come to fruition that making multiplayer games it's easier in the future than now i would also love to see that because in summer i was trying to do something like that by myself and oh my god it didn't work out also jj asks why you stopped uploading tells he wants to see more mechanics recreated in unity what was the last video <laughs> that was april right so mm -hmm. i guess the short answer is i am just like taking my time my sweet precious time to do because um obviously with time i've been involved in a lot more stuff so not only my nine to five job also like personal projects that i do with friends or some other work that i do so i just take time now because these videos not only take a lot of time to make but i've also become more increasingly increasingly complex like if you take the last three videos like the Metroid Dread stuff, the Pathless gameplay. Like these are scenes that are like almost vertical slice scale where they have everything that is confined on that mechanic. So there's the interaction, there's the visual effects. So they do take a lot of time. So of course, after doing these things, I feel like super tired. For example, there's games that have been releasing now, especially on the Switch that I've been looking, playing and always thinking like, oh my God, yeah, maybe that might be in my next video. Um, but you know, there's like, there's that, there's personal life, there's like so much stuff that, and, and I'm only one person doing Mix and Jam at the end of the day. So I guess my answer is just, just keep an eye open. If there's a day that I stop, you know, like officially stop, you will know. But like, I haven't stopped. It's just a fact of like, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job to, to create content, to make these projects, to put them on a repository, to make the script, to record the audio. So I'm, I'm never taking that for granted. And sometimes I definitely burn out. That's for sure. Sometimes I definitely burn out and I have to take my time. And I've been finding that that's a more like a uh, healthy relationship that I have with the channel is doing the videos when I think it makes sense and when I'm ready to put the things out. So soon, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah, I think it's a better approach because also when I was talking to Freya and Kyle Banks, they also mentioned burnout and it's very hard to have it, especially in a field that you actually enjoy. That's the thing about public exposure is that, especially with YouTube, um, the way the way posting videos work and, and sort of like following up to things makes you always want to be there. Like there's this huge FOMO. You just want to be there and, and make sure that people are noticing you, right? Uh, but that's the thing about Mix and Jam. I never intended it to be that sort of thing where, you know, I'm sort of like highlighting and seeing like, hey, you know, here's... Here's what I'm doing, here's everything. Uh, it's like this learning journey. Um, so now the projects that I make in Mix and Jam are so complex that they take a lot of time. But at the end of the day, I do still think they're worth it because I'm not trying to do like quantity of videos, I'm just trying to do quality. And because the repos are open and the videos are educational, I think it's like a win-win. Like people are gonna learn a lot more than what they did with, I don't know, maybe initial videos. But um, I definitely, should post something soon enough hopefully again fingers crossed yeah hopefully also when i first saw your channel i thought there are a lot of people behind it the first idea was that oh my god i think a lot of people take care of this channel but turns out it's well, only you <laughs> the, what, yeah. what i will say is that like i every now and then like i have uh friends that i like ask questions and be like hey how do you do that and then you know like classic discord call calls when i'm like i just don't know what to do this um, so the heroes, right? The heroes behind, like, I guess the friends, your friends and game development friends are always like heroes when you're stuck. Uh, but in, yes, in general, yes, I'm like doing everything. I love it. By all means, I love doing everything. It's actually a lot, like super incredible. And that's why Mix and Jam, like I'm super proud of it because it feels a hundred percent like what I always want it to be. Um, but uh, if you think about it, like if you dissect, is actually 
wild. It's just like develop screen recording, editing, scripting, <laughs> editing, posting, put it on GitHub, put it on Patreon. Like there's, there's so much stuff. Um, I'm not complaining at the same time, right? I'm very blessed. So I definitely like to have it that way. Do you also write the script before every video or you just turn on the camera and start? I definitely write. No, no, no. I definitely write the script. So I love content that's like very curated. Before starting Mix and Jam, like my consumption was primor primarily like video essay kind of thing. So everything like analyzing the color blocking of this movie. I, I watch a lot of video essays on movie things. <laughs> Um, like from channels like Every Frame a Painting or Nerd Writer, these like video essay channels that are like super well structured, topic centrated, like curated stuff. So I was watching that and then Game Makers Toolkit, right, from Mark Brown. Like that was a channel I was watching a lot as well. So I do love the approach of making everything short and sweet. So I always write the script before, but I do have the footage of me developing the thing and key points of development where I'm doing certain things because it, the educational purpose is higher than anything else. Like I try to find the bit, bits and pieces that I know are going to be useful. So I don't know if you take like my latest video on the Bellatro thing, I'm not going to explicitly say every single thing that I implemented to do this. I think that when you're teaching and when you're trying to give like the highlights of how this effect was achieved, I think you can focus on the most important parts and then the bridges sort of like create themselves. So I create the script and then I record the audio and I edit the video. And as you know, it is what it is. I definitely prefer that style. DJ also said that he likes that you always take care of small details while recreating. I also appreciate like, that. Uh, from, a, from a very visual background, I definitely think a lot about like, yeah, VFX and or even like tweening, uh, sort of like smoothing out animation. So I am, I'm personally obsessed with that kind of stuff. So it makes more sense for me to turn that part of Mix and Jam to be like, you know, like these are little things that at the end of the day make the experience so much better. So it's all about game feel at the end of the day. And uh, yeah, I'm glad people also like that because I'm definitely a lover. And now a very hot topic. How do you imagine the future of game development considering AI? Like when you, for example, give it a prompt and it suddenly starts to create a game from scratch. Hot topic indeed. I think as I mentioned previously, I think that games are this beautiful expression of creativity. Mm -hmm. So there's something really human about expressing things. Where I think AI falls off on game dev, I think it's more about solving issues that you don't have to solve right like you don't have to think about where am i going to bake my lights so that the game is performant am i going to use a an event a unity event or can i do things on update i think that kind of thing theoretically is where i see that ai becomes more like tools but when it comes to just like a general prompt, like, oh, just make me a game. Then you're just taking away the entire aspect of what makes a, a, a game sort of like an expression, right, of something. I guess every game, arcade AAA or not, is trying to say something or it speaks about the person, the people who are making them. So, like the, you know, the very generic, like, I think this was showing up on social media, like this phrase, like, I want my AI to be doing like laundry. I want my AI mm -hmm. to be doing like cleaning the house and not like building. I know it's a very like uh, oversimplification of what AI can do, but I think I'm on that mentality of, yeah, just like if it's helping you do the things that are annoying, I think that's the direction it should go. But about like, I don't think, I don't know. I don't know so much about how I feel about when games go like, just, uh, just make me a new game. It's like, you know, that it takes the whole human aspect of it. And personally, that's the part about games that I love is like the, the stories they're telling it, not, not only about the actual media story, but from the people who are making them. I don't know if I overcomplicated my answer, but I guess. No, I, I got it. It's okay. Also, just like JJ says, AI won't replace artists, artists who uses AI will. Yeah, wise words here. Yeah, but you know, like I'm, I wasn't even thinking about art specifically, right? I was thinking about just having the entire game exist if you think about design as well, like design is different. Think about how different systems work with each other. 
and there is creativity involved in that, right? Like if you go to any AI thing today and go like, I have a jump mechanic and I have, you know, a crouch mechanic, what games I can do with it? It will only drive from existing experiences and stuff. Like I'll never try to do something new, I guess. I, I'm not an expert, like I'm, I don't use AI much. That's what I mean is the tooling, everything will exist. If you think about computers back in the day and things that we don't have to think about now, like things that are automatic are kind of like AI, if you think about it. But I think that the creativity for an aspect. So I'm not talk even talking about the assets that are going to be generated. That's a different, that's a completely different thing. I'm talking about just the aspect of putting A and B and C together and making a playful experience. That's an entire new beast. And I think that it's nicer when it's uh, made by, you know, creative people and everyone around them. Now, are there any exciting news from Unity you want to share? Or if not from Unity? from the project that you are working on? Well, from Unity, I guess everything that is public, right? Like there's no news. <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> that is not out that I can talk about at all. But the recent Unite stuff re unveiled a bunch of stuff. And I think those are, are worth uh, seeing. And I know that the last stream that you made was talking a little bit about Unity 6. Um, so there's a lot that people can watch in that stream or also watch in the Unite conference. Um, for my projects, I think that, like I said before, I definitely want to make a mix and jam video soon. There are projects that I've made, like there's the Hey Listen game that I've made in the past that I've been wanting to revisit, like make a, a better version of it or something like a revisited version because it's been a while since I've done that HIO demo. Yeah. And then more stuff that you will hear in the future, but that I cannot talk about now, I guess. <laughs> Someone asked me, how do I find YouTubers for my videos? And yeah. <laughs> Just courage. <laughs> That's yeah. all it takes. Sort of like rephrase it because, yeah, we talked a little bit about this yeah. before we started. But like people who are making stuff and that you like. And there was there was a point where all these people were in the same place, right? Everyone has someone they're like and they watch their videos and they're like, oh, man, I wish I could be them. And then for some event, you make you create something and then you're you're actually known for that. You're still that same person. And I'm sure that everyone who started making anything that has some popularity came from that same position. So one thing that you do find out in this world is that you sometimes just message people. Right. And mm -hmm. as I was saying before, just be gentle. Like if you're, if you're gentle, if you're nice, like good intentioned, talk to people. Make sure that you're like, I don't know, talking somehow like educated. People will reply, right? And if they don't reply, it's not because people like are like snobby. <laughs> like, I think it's like, it depends on people's availability. Really. Sure. As always, just try. So yes, courage. Also, I would love to be next year at Unite. I would love to be part of a like game development conference at least once. Yeah. Sure. My tip, you continue doing the the content that you're doing and somehow like focus it on on specific things that like i don't know development key points i know that unity has a program that they're like embracing people who are creating content also gg says can you provide passes for the next two nights i wish <laughs> i wish i can't i have i'm just a, i'm just a single person doing stuff like i have no, i have no privileges whatsoever this interview was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here today. It really, yeah, thank you. It really means a lot. I will continue to follow you and I hope you guys do the same. So good luck in your extraordinary career. That was pretty much it. Yeah, thank you so much. It's nice and I, I wish the same for you. Like, I know that the whole point of your channel is capturing your evolution. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that th that's the best way to evolve. It's just like being able to share that without, you know, without thinking too much, just like share. And then you'll have a better idea of like how people receive stuff, how to improve, how to learn, get to know new people. So I think you're definitely on a good, like great path, like super, super great path. And uh, yeah, I wish you the best. Also, good luck. Thank you very, very much. Also, it's very weird because when I started this YouTube channel, I didn't expect you know, having someone like you and also Freya and also on this channel, like it's pretty huge. And I hope that makes you mod motivated because that's what it takes. Yes. It's just like, it could keep going and you'll soon find out exactly like specifically on YouTube, like what does the algorithm like that kind of thing, like mm -hmm. that is very specific to YouTube. So yeah, I think, I think you're in a great position. So just keep doing it. And if you need anything from me or from Freya, cause I know, I also know Freya, 
Uh, she's oh. incredible. Um, yeah, just let us know. We're more than happy to like help. Thank you very much. I appreciate it a lot. And as I said, good luck on your journey as well. Thank and you. Thank you. Maybe see you hopefully at Unite. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Okay. Thank you very much. That was it. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.